we will commence. Good morning, everyone. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to join us today for our panel discussion masterclass, Hire Like a Hero, Strategic Talent Acquisition to Enhance Your Business DNA. My name is Kate, and I'm the Global Head of Talent here at Employment Hero. And I'm joined today by my wonderful colleague, Jenny Williams, one of our talent acquisition managers, and our guest speaker, Phil Hatchard, who is the Managing Director at Actual Intelligence. I know both Jenny and Phil, but I think it would be fantastic if perhaps they briefly intro themselves um, for everyone that's dialing in. So Jenny, would you like to go first and give a quick intro? Hi there, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so as introduced, I'm one of the talent acquisition managers here at Employment Hero. I joined the business in September 2020. Um, so I've been here um, just over three and a half years. Um, and I specialize in recruitment for the customer experience and product teams. Um, however, I have had a long career um, spanning across uh, technology and even agency uh, recruitment as well. So yeah, excited to be here today. Thanks, Jenny. And Phil, would you like to intro yourself? Thank you, Kate. So hi, I'm Phil Hatchard, Managing Director and Founder of Actual Intelligence, a recruitment coaching and consulting company uh, that focuses on human to human connection and growth in the tech sector. Uh, I've got nearly 25 years in technology and recruitment and I've spent the last decade working at global brands, Adobe, Google and Microsoft to elevate recruitment processes and hire great talent. Um, I live in Lennox Head up near Byron Bay with my wife, two boys, and a dog named Molly. So that's a bit about me. Awesome. Um, well, before we kick off, just a little bit of housekeeping, I'm afraid. Um, so letting you know that we have allocated at the end of the webinar some time for questions. Um, there'll be a box where you can drop the questions in, and then we'll be going through them at the end of the session. Um, for any questions that we don't have time to get to, we will endeavor to answer them after the webinar. Um, so don't fret if we're not able to answer them live, we will find a way to get back to you. Um, I'd also like to note that today's session is being recorded and the recording and slides will be available after the webinar has concluded. Um, so if there's anything that you would like to revisit, um, you'll be able to go back and have a flick through. Um, quick reminder, in today's session, we will be focusing on three key topics. Firstly, attracting the right talent. Secondly, interview tips for assessing cultural ads and fit for DNA. And thirdly, and very importantly, some strategies for SME success. Um, but to help guide the discussion today and make it as valuable as possible, we would actually like to start by launching a very quick poll to get your input on what you're hoping to get from the webinar today. Um, and I believe the answers are um, either that you'd like to learn more about attracting the right talent, that you would like to learn more about interview tips, or you would like to learn more about strategies for SME success. Or I think there's also an option for all of the above. If you wouldn't mind filling that out quickly, that would be fantastic. Um, we'll just make sure that we're spending enough time on the areas that are most of interest for those of you dialing in today. Just give that a minute for everyone to respond. I would like to learn more about attracting the right talent was the number one answer, um, as well as all of the above. Um, so I think we'll make sure that we definitely spend a good amount of time on talent attraction. Fantastic. Um, well, I would like to maybe start off by setting the scene. So why is it important to hire talent that is the right fit for your business's culture and DNA? There are a few important factors here and I think it's quite important to maybe set the scene. So Phil, can you kick off for us by perhaps telling us why it is that it's important to hire candidates that are the right fit for the company culture, the right fit for the DNA, because I'm sure you've got some battle scars from previous roles. Yes, one or two, but thankfully not too many that, that I need to worry about. Um, but look, I'll kick off with a little story to, I, I guess, highlight the importance of culture. So in 2014, when Satya Nadella took over as the CEO of Microsoft from Steve Barmer, it wasn't going too well for Microsoft. I think they were heading very much in the wrong direction. And most definitely, you know, they'd made some poor investments in technology and their culture was quite frankly in a downward spiral. Fast forward to 2024, 
And now they've achieved over a hundred percent, no, a thousand percent growth uh, in their share price and is now one of the highest valued companies on earth with a market cap of three trillion. Uh, and they trade places regularly for that top spot with Apple. Um, yes, Satya made some great strategic decisions on where to invest in tech, but what really underpinned their transformation was a huge and intentional change in their culture. And so gone were the days of internal competition, this concept that knowledge is power and let's withhold information, you know, that type of philosophy, uh, you know, where there were barriers up between teams and conflict in KPIs and so forth. That was all knocked down. It was replaced with teamwork, customer obsession, shared accountability uh, amongst a whole raft of other cultural attributes. And so not everyone is shooting to be the next valuable, most valuable company in the world. I get that, right? But this does highlight what can be achieved when you have culture as the cornerstone of how you hire and operate. And if you think about any successful team, whether that's business or sports, they've not got there through a poor culture. Culture is the alignment of values, practices, beliefs, what's tolerated and what's not tolerated from a behavior standpoint. And every great team needs to be aligned on the culture. That is expectations on what to on what we want to achieve but more importantly how we want to achieve it right both microsoft and google put heavy emphasis on assessing cultural attributes by assessing both the what and the how and in google the broad term for this is googliness um candidates would regularly fall short on cultural interviews right despite having all the required skills and they would wouldn't quite frankly get the role if interviewers were concerned about how those results would be achieved uh, there weren't many, I have to say, as I've said, but on the odd occasion when someone did slip through the net and were quite quickly identified as having poor cultural alignment, uh, it does cause a considerable drain on resources and energy uh, You know, to manage the conflict that comes along with it. It impacted the manager's ability to lead the team. It impacts the team's ability to execute in their roles. It impacts on your team, how they interact with cross-functional teams. Just everything completely goes wrong. And probably one of the most significant areas is if it shows up in front of customers, it can put your organization at both reputational and legal risk in some cases. And, and we did see that happen from time to time. Um, the last thing I'd say on this one is, you know, you kind of mentioned it earlier in culture ad is, is that culture isn't static. It constantly evolves. And the, the concept we talked a lot at Google and Microsoft is the idea of culture ad. And so it's not just about the candidate fitting in with our culture, but how can this candidate contribute to our culture in a positive way, right? And further who we are as a company. And so, you know, because what got us here today is not, not, not necessarily what's going to get us there, you know, as we move forward. So, you know, those are sort of some of the key takeaways, I think, in terms of the importance of, of culture and DNA and hiring. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I would actually say we've probably got our first SME tip nestled somewhere in there. If you are in HR or talent and you're finding that you're struggling to bring your hiring managers on board or your CEO on board with hiring people that are the right cultural ad and are the right fit for the DNA or vice versa, maybe you're the business owner and you're, you're struggling to get your hiring team um, on board with that, whatever the scenario um, I think putting it in, in that lens of hiring the right people from a cultural perspective, not only a technical perspective, has a big impact on the company's ability to perform and building that really kind of high productivity, high performance culture. That's a really, really impactful way, I think, of maybe bringing people on side. So um, great anecdotes and thank you so much for sharing, Phil. Jen, is there anything that you would add to that? Yeah, uh, look, I'd love to add some additional points and love a bit of story time, Phil. So thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, I think what um, is really important to remember when you're attracting and hiring the right candidates based on your company's DNA, it really actually comes down to your recruitment strategy. So probably to the point that Kate's making is when you think of recruitment, it's, it's your foundational building block. It's where you're setting the expectations up front of what it's actually like to work for your company. And now, whether that's communicated through a job advert or it's throughout the interview hiring process, holistically, that hiring process is the very first step in someone's employment journey with your company. So this is probably where you want to introduce things like your company's vision and mission. It could be some specifics around the business goals or objectives. 
Um, but more importantly, it's showcasing your company values because these are your guiding principles that underpin and shape your company DNA. I mean, values are the way in which we align the business harmoniously with employee behaviours and that company culture. So obviously, whilst we have highlighted some of the bad outcomes of hiring for the wrong DNA, some good outcomes I'd like to highlight is maybe simply getting some higher acceptance rates to your job offers. It could also be high engagement scores or employee satisfaction, good glass door reviews, low attrition rates, and overall just higher business performance, um, just to name a few. Yeah, completely agree and, and love the positivity. Um, that was awesome. Thank you so much, guys, for sharing um, and setting the scene a little bit. Um, I think now that we understand both the risks and opportunities associated with hiring the right talent or the wrong talent from a cultural standpoint, let's talk about um, talent attraction. Um, so people were interested particularly to hear about this, and I think it is a good place to start anyway. Um, so if we're going to hire candidates who are a great fit for our DNA, step one, we have to attract them. They have to be coming to us or responding to our messages, whatever it might be, um, and expressing an interest in the first place. So Jenny, I'll stick with you to kick off with. When you think about attracting the right talent for your business's culture and DNA, what tools would you say HR managers and hiring managers have at their disposal to make sure they're attracting the right people at, at, at that kind of early stage? Yeah, really, really great question and perfect segue off, I guess, the back of what we've just been talking about because we really now want to talk about the how. How are we going to put that recruitment strategy into action? And a really great way to actually do this is by utilizing recruitment or HR software, technologies and tools. And that's to manage what can probably seem like a pretty overwhelming process to attract the right talent. Um, so for the attendees that have joined us today that may not be familiar with this term ATS, this actually stands for Applicant Tracking System. Um, so for most recruiters, an ATS is the primary tool in our toolkit. Um, it's a software tool that's designed to automate and streamline a lot of the manual processes that can be quite time consuming in that recruitment process. Um, one of the most important processes to automate and streamline is how are you going to advertise your company and the vacancies that you would like to recruit? And that's without having to log into multiple different job boards, post different job adverts on different platforms, and then you need to review all the applicants that apply, right? Well, an ATS is designed to be your single source of truth. And for example, it would be Remiss if I did not use Employment Hero as the example here. Uh, we actually have our own ATS product that allows you to open the job and uh, create a job advert once. You can then post that job advert to multiple different job sites like Seek, LinkedIn, Indeed, and also Employment Hero's very own job board called Swag. Now, the cool thing about Swag is that you can create a company careers page, and that's where you can showcase everything we talked about from your company mission, values, culture, ways of working, and you can include photos and videos, and most importantly, you know, highlight the career opportunities that are on offer. Um, so Swag allows you to really paint a great picture of your company DNA, and this should entice applicants to apply. And when they do, the applications are then fed all back to the ATS, where you, then you can review all the applications in one place. Now, this is going to allow you to work efficiently and at, at an accelerated pace without the hassle of managing candidate communications across multiple different platforms. Um, so, for example, if you had quite a lot of applicants to decline, you can actually do that as a bulk action and do the um, automation of rejecting candidates. Um, but equally, the ATS is actually uh, to manage the entire recruitment process. So it's automating and streamlining, yeah, multiple tasks that might include scheduling interviews, collating feedback, um, emailing candidates with updates on their application, and the best part, extending an offer. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. So I think careers page is a really big one that you've highlighted there. 
And that is a tool that every recruiter or hiring manager can have um, that really allows them to showcase the company culture, the DNA, what it's actually like to work there and what they're all about. Um, and actually, I was just reflecting then on what you were saying around things like candidate comms and, and how you can manage that through an ATS. I would also argue that that is another way of making sure you get the right talent for your company. Let's say, for example, you're very customer centric um, and that's how you like to operate thinking about how you manage that candidate through the early stages of the process and therefore the reputation that you build and how they're going to talk about you to people in their network is another great way of making sure you're attracting people um, that are a good fit for your business. Um, Phil, thinking a bit more about what to actually include on a careers page or a position description, talk to me about the kinds of information that you think should be on there in order to attract candidates that are the right fit. Yeah, great question. Um, I think as a first step, obviously the business needs to be really clear on what their culture is. And it's also, I think, important not to confuse benefits and perks with culture, right? Pool tables, ping pong and free food, they're perks. Trust, empathy, psychological safety, flexible work environments, that's culture, right? And I'm not sure anyone has stayed in the role because of a pool table but I'm pretty sure that people have, lots of people have left roles because they don't trust their manager or they don't feel included in their teams, right? That's the really important piece to really uh, think about here. The good news is that you can actually include both on your careers page. Of course, people want to know about the environment. They want to know about the ping pong tables and the pool tables and the, you know, the day outs and the trips and the fun stuff. Everyone wants to know about that, but they also want to be valued, respected, trusted. Right, So you want to call out both of those things on both your careers page and your job descriptions. If you take a look at the Microsoft careers page, it has a page dedicated to culture where it talks about growth mindset, customer obsession, diverse and inclusive, and one Microsoft. And I particularly like this statement. We're a family of individuals united by a single shared mission. It's our ability to work together that makes our dreams believable and ultimately achievable. We will build on the idea of others and collaborate across boundaries to bring the best of Microsoft to our and, and to our customers as one, right? And I really like that. It talks about success through collaboration and shared accountability. Um, so think about how you publish your culture code on your careers page, including both the company mission and the expected ways of working for your employees. Um, hand in hand with that, imagery is really important, right? Um, People connect with imagery when they look at a website. Um, as an example, you can't really talk about diverse hiring practices if all the imagery is of one racial demographic. So you need to mix it up a little bit. Um, if we think about job description, the job descriptions for a moment, and from the, again from the standpoint of it, uh, inclusivity, you should also consider running them through an inclusive language tool. And there are a number of choo number to choose. From, these essentially help you change the language of your JDs to be more reflective of the audience that you're trying to attract. Phrases like aggressive sales targets, energetic, fast-paced environments are kind of not really that great to write on JDs these days. Phrases like uh, collaboration, support, and teamwork are words that land differently with your audience uh, and does make a difference to the type of people that you, uh, that you ultimately want to attract. And again, to build on the comment earlier about culture ad, both the careers page and job descriptions, be open to new perspectives and ideas. As a hiring manager, you can ask yourself, what skills and experiences do I not have in my team today that would add value to the group as a whole, right? How, do I, how can I push the boundaries of my team forward in a positive way? How can I add to the team? Not just think about replacing like for like based on whatever reason the role is available in the first place. So. You know, those are a few things to think about. And I think lastly, what I'll say is, you know, the, what is written in the JDs and the career page needs to be backed up in reality as well, right? Which comes down to leadership uh, from the top down through to the line managers. So you have to ensure that your leaders are clear on the company culture so they can set that tone with their teams and know what to look for when hiring. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And um, if you don't mind, I would also like to preempt a question that we might get because it's one that I often get. Um, so as an employer, should I be forthcoming about aspects of our culture or our ways of working, 
even if they might deter some applicants. So for example, if I'm a business that requires people to work from the office five days a week, and I know that um, it's not popular with everyone and some people don't wanna be in the office five days a week, should I still include that sort of information on my careers page and on my job adverts or should I keep it to myself? Um, this is an interesting one. And I think since COVID, we've seen a huge shift in attitudes around remote and hybrid working to the point where it's almost becoming a baseline expectation for a lot of people, right? But we all get it, right? Not every role can work from home. You know, builders, Uber and bus drivers and machinery workers can't work from home, right? But decisions around hybrid and remote working do need to make sense for your business. But if the reason is, oh, it's what we've always done, or it's just, I wanna see what my employees are doing every day, then I'd start to look at whether that belief is gonna serve you in the long term, and you'll certainly end up missing out on a large proportion of the available talent pool for your market. Um, plus no one has ever really woken up and said, I wanna be micromanaged today, or I wanna go into work so I can be watched, you know, so my manager can look over my shoulder to see what I'm doing, right? No one's ever said that. Um, but if there are genuine reasons for people to be in the office five times a week, then then yeah, I'd say call it out in the job description. I think it's not something you necessarily need on your careers page. You could say something like, you know, due to the nature of our business, some of our roles may be required to be on site full time Monday to Friday. Speak to your recruiter about you know what the role on a on a role by role basis. Or words to that effect, something along those lines. Uh, and from a, a JD perspective, you can specify, you know, on the job descriptions, in it, like I said, on a role by role basis, which role is is must be in the uh, must be in the office full time, or which ones could be flex, hybrid, remote, or on site. Just yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, if there's a, a sensible business reason um, as to why your setup is that way, whether it's hybrid, remote, or a completely different facet of your business and how you work. Um, I think own it and just be really transparent yeah. about it um, and forthcoming with why that is. Um, and if they're the right fit, they'll, they will understand that. Um, and it's, it's key one, I think, um, to attracting the right kinds of people. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. And that's, and that's culture ad, right? It's how do we evolve from what we used to do to a new way of working and how do we collaborate, share information in distributed teams and those sorts of things. So that's a great example. Yeah, fantastic. Um, well, I think that um, hopefully summarizes some good key tips around talent attraction. Um, we've spent a good amount of time on that. So I would now like to talk about the actual hiring process. So once we've attracted people to our careers page um, or whatever else it might be, how are we then assessing them to make sure that they are the right fit for our culture and our DNA? Um, and Jen, I was hoping that maybe you could kick off by telling us a bit more about how you can design a hiring process that allows you to assess a candidate's alignment to your company culture and values. What is step one and how can they design from there? Yeah, really great question. And step one, I think, really starts with the why. Why do you need to hire this role? And once you've established a really clear purpose for the position, then you can look at the competencies and skills that are actually required. So this all starts with, yeah, compelling, uh, a crafting, sorry, a compelling job description. You do not need to overcomplicate this step. It should just be a clear list of the job's responsibilities and requirements in terms of skills, qualifications um, and experience. So once you've posted that job description in the form of a job ad and you're now starting to receive applications, you then want to make a priority list of the top requirements that are necessary to fill the position. So for example, and perfectly off the back of what Bill has highlighted um, is around like, is it specific around location? Maybe the ability to work on or off site is a make or break for this position. Maybe it's down to a specific skill or qualification. Like we can't have people hired in this role unless they have a specific qualification or certificate, um, or it could just be down to specific industry experience. I mean, there are so many, so many um, options, but having these priorities in place will allow you to create a short list um, that you may want to proceed with um, to the next round. Um, now, where the hiring processes um, now are getting very individualized, so I'm not going to set out a clear methodology because you really need to design that hiring process 
you know, best on your business, um, but you may need to include things like a test or an assessment to assess technical skills. Um, there could be a workshop or a presentation round for hiring a senior member. Uh, it, there could be multiple interview panels and stages, um, and that's to assess culture fit, experience, skills, um, communication. Um, and then there are some companies that actually do uh, reference checks. So contacting their previous employer for an employment reference. So keeping, again, this very broadly speaking and without trying to narrow in on a particular hiring method, it's, again, really important at each step of the hiring process that you do ensure you're assessing the candidate's abilities alongside their alignment to your company's values. Now, you can do this by establishing a set of interview questions that really focus on the job competencies where you're asking the candidate to provide some specific examples. So, for example, uh, you're wanting to assess uh, someone's ability to lead a team in a remote work environment. Well, you may want to ask something like, could you please tell me about the experience you have with managing a team in a remote environment to ensure they're engaged, aligned and motivated? So opening up that question really, really open gives them the ability to actually talk through their experience. No kind of yes or no answers here. You want them to elaborate as much as possible and really define um, their experience through the examples that they may have. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'll also say that if you have a really clear set of values as a company, like we do at Employment Hero, um, we also designed uh, like a question guide where we mapped out each of our values and then a few interview questions that were specifically designed to assess fit for that. Um, and I know that everyone on the team is kind of interweaving those questions um, throughout the interviews that they're running combined with some of those really broad open style behavioral questions that, that Jen just talked through. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, something that we have personally experienced and perhaps struggled with a little bit um, sometimes is maintaining our DNA as we scale. Um, I think as you get bigger, the culture can quite easily become diluted if you are thoughtful about how you hire and who you bring into the team. Um, and Phil, obviously having worked for some of those bigger businesses like Adobe and like Google, I would like to talk about maintaining your DNA as you scale um, via your hiring process. So what tips would you have for scaling businesses on how to maintain that? Yeah, great question. Um, and there's three things I'll say on this. The first is, and we've talked about it already, leadership. It's so critical when it comes to uh, ensuring that your culture maintains uh, its true essence as you grow. And, and, you know, culture is defined and embodied by the leadership teams. It comes from the top down. It just does. Um, appointing great leaders is, this, you know, as we talked about, the single most important thing that you can do. Uh, whether you're hiring or promoting internally or whether you're hiring externally, you have to ensure the leader is in line with those company cultural values. Um, if you're not, you won't have a company culture anymore you'll end up with a series of subcultures based on the values and practices of those individual leaders. And I've seen this multiple times uh, in the last 10 years. And unfortunately, it does breed inconsistencies in the experiences of the employees, many of which lead to very negative experiences when there's lots of different leaders that have got different values and different beliefs on how work should be done and how people should interact and cooperate with each other. Um, so who do you appoint as a leader? Often companies default to the person that was the best performer as an individual contributor, but that doesn't always work. And in fact, often it doesn't. You know, the attitudes and competencies that made this person a great IC is often the very same attributes that will make them a terrible leader, right? Uh, as an IC, they're focused on what they need to do to hit their own numbers. If you think about a sales leader, for example, you know, um, what you really want is somebody who can lift others and support their team rather than thinking about their own success. And one of the most senior leaders at Google globally once said to me, when I became a leader, I worked for my team. My team didn't work for me. And I absolutely love that philosophy and that concept. And I think it embodies how leaders should think. Um, it's a different mindset. And some people can flip and focus and adapt, but that needs to be tested. You shouldn't just automatically promote people from an IC to a management role without assessing 
their cultural values and how they're going to impart that onto the onto the group and that's so critical as you scale secondly bake it into your performance metrics um I think the late great Charlie Munger, who was Warren Buffett's uh, business partner, famously said, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcomes, right? So measuring people, not just on what they've done, but how they do it, right, is really important. Be clear in on what's expected uh, in terms of how you show up and collaborate and support others in the pursuit of your company goals. Just hitting goals isn't enough. You want to protect your culture. We've all seen salespeople hit their numbers, but at the same time, they've burnt relationships and they've left a trail of bodies behind them and it's a complete disaster. And lastly, provide a feedback loop where employees are empowered to innovate and make suggestions for constant improvement. And as you scale, the last thing you want are cumbersome bureaucratic processes that don't work or serve you anymore. It slows everybody down, it causes friction, which causes frustration and so on and so forth. I've recently read about the, the, this concept called the Kaizen approach, which is, I understand, a Japanese philosophy famously adopted by Toyota in their production plants. It completely revolutionized how Toyota uh, produced their cars and continued to do so. And it's an idea that talks about continuous improvement and changing things for the better. I think you know, that this type of approach will help to bust bureaucracy and drive continuous innovation in terms of systems process, but more importantly, culture. Listen to what your employees are telling you. Listen to what's working, what's not working. Do pulse surveys bi-yearly on, on your employees and, and sort of pressure test how they're feeling about the culture, those sorts of things. Uh, you can set up multiple different formal or informal processes for this. Um, so yeah, to wrap up, I think it's, you know, hire great leaders that can protect and maintain your culture. Measure people on their cultural contribution, not just their results from a financial or a KPI perspective. And seek to improve, seek to knock down barriers that aren't serving you anymore. Kind of answer. There is a lot to unpick there, and I'm cognizant <laughs> of time, um, but completely agree with everything you just yeah. said. Um, we have a wonderful head of learning and development, Garth, um, who helped design our performance appraisal process. And this is maybe a tip for, for SMEs who are just um, digesting the great tips that Phil just gave as well. Um, we measure performance both based on performance in the role um, and whether or not they're, they're sort of meeting overall targets, but also how aligned are you to our values and are you living those values day in, day out? And in order to get the top performance rating, you need to be scoring really highly, both in your technical performance in the role, but also how you align to the values and whether or not you are living and breathing them every day. And I think that's a really pragmatic way of making sure that even as the business scales, um, yes, you've hired those people and brought them in and they're starting off on the right foot, which is um, all the things that we just talked about, but also you continue to monitor that and incentivize the right kind of behavior as you scale. Um, so fantastic tips, thank you very much. I'm cognizant of the time, but I would like to um, round up before we head into Q&A um, with some practical tips for SMEs. Um, so can I get you both to share your top two tips for small businesses when it comes to hiring talent that is the right fit for their DNA? And Phil, we'll stick with you. Can you share your top two tips, please? So firstly, it's hard to keep to two. <laughs> But I'll do two high level and then a couple of sub points underneath one or two of them. So for me, it's about, again, we've talked about it, defining your culture, what you stand for and staying true to that. Don't compromise as you hire, right? To dig a little deeper, everyone must be aligned on the values, norms, vision, strategy of the company. That's critical. Um, in terms of getting the hiring piece right, there's a couple of practical tips I think that are key. Firstly, you have to have the right hiring managers that promote the values of the company. Second, I would recommend having a diverse group on the interview panel. I'd recommend having individuals from different backgrounds, different teams that embody the culture, right? So mix that up a little bit. At Google's, they had somebody uh, called the cross-functional interviewer, which was somebody completely unrelated to the team, unrelated to the role, didn't care about performance in role. They were just assessing culture. They were just assessing culture. They weren't a fit. They had the ability to veto that hire. Um, lastly, have an interview plan. Right, with attributes to find focus areas allocated for each interviewer, incorporate culture-based questions uh, into your interview. Don't compromise on that, even if they're a great performer. Um, culture, I think, should be assessed at least twice. It's important to plan. So many interview interviews are conducted on the fly, unprepared, 
don't know the candidate, don't know the questions to ask, and it's a, just it becomes a disaster. And that's not how you should hire. You need to invest and take the time in your most important asset, which is your people. Um, and have a post interview sync, right? What do people like? What didn't they like? What was the cultural fit? Challenge each other's thinking, challenge each other's biases. Uh, and, and, you know, if you actually have a rigorous plan in place uh, and a decision making criteria in place, you should be fine. Fab. Thank you ever so much. And Jen, what are your top two tips? But if you've got more than two, we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like I should have synced with Phil before jumping on this call because that's very, very similar. So we must be in sync here. But I think number one is definitely be authentic. What often gets forgotten in interview processes is that they're actually a two-way street, yes? Today, we have absolutely focused on the role of the employer, making sure we find the right person that's the DNA fit, the culture fit to the business. But don't forget, the candidate is also interviewing you to see whether they are suited to your business or the role. So it's in your best interest to be as transparent as possible, lead with honesty rather than mis-selling the opportunity, because that's when you're not going to have true alignment and end up maybe with an unfortunate hire. So yeah, transparency and authenticity is probably my top tip. Second tip, definitely following on what from Phil has said, preparation is key. Case in point um, for my first one where candidates are interviewing you. So please familiarize yourself with their CV, their experience, their background. No one wants to waste their time with someone that is underprepared. Um, and obviously that's perhaps a reflection on, yeah, your, your business as well. So please do ensure you, yeah, have a plan in place and, Come prepared for the interview, no kind of interruptions or distractions. Be really, really present in that moment and you give that time to that candidate because, trust me, they have put time into preparation for that interview as well. Can I just share a little anecdote, a little amusing yes, anecdote? Yes, please. From a piece of feedback from a manager, the company of which shall remain nameless, and the manager will definitely be name, name, uh, remain nameless, but... Um, this is an indication of what comes up if you don't plan for the interview, which was feedback that said, this candidate likes Harry Potter. I like Harry Potter. This candidate likes Formula One. I like Formula One. They're a hire. That was it. That was the feedback. I don't think that was great planning. I don't, certainly don't think it was great feedback. <laughs> poor planning and poor, poor feedback, I would say. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Preparation is key. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for sharing, guys. Maybe I'll share one more tip from my side as well um, before we head into Q&A because I can see the number of questions um, bumping up. Um, quick tip from me would be running a really thorough interview process or hiring process and spending enough time with the candidate covering off, are they a fit for the values? Will they add to the culture? It takes time. Um, so really leverage recruitment tools where you can to reduce the amount of time you are spending on the staff that's boring, um, which is things like posting job ads, sifting through applicants, get as much of that as possible off of your hands using tech. Um, you could use something like Smart Match. There are, there are other tools as well available to you. That then frees up your time to be invested in actually spending time with the individual, really making sure they understand your culture and really making sure that they are the best possible fit. So um, that would maybe be the final addition from me, but we are now heading into Q&A. Um, so give me one moment. Um, I'm just going to be scrolling through here and reading out loud. Um, if they're directed to a particular individual, I will push them in your direction, Phil and Jenny. Otherwise, um, whoever wants to pop up and answer is welcome to. Um, so the first question is, what about industry-specific job platforms? Can this link to the ATS? Um, it depends on the exact type of job platform and how niche it is, but the vast majority of them will and can. Um, but if, Jen, you would like to add anything further to that, go ahead. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm probably not able to maybe answer specifically because I think it depends on what ATS platform you're using. Um, majority of them will um, link to the, to the larger job sites. Um, but yeah, for industry specific, you might have to reach out to that job board or your ATS provider um, to, to see if that's possible. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't have a more concrete answer on that one. Fantastic. 
Um, second question was, what inclusive language tools would you recommend? Do either of you have any tips on that? I think this is probably around um, job descriptions and how you present roles in market. Yeah, the ones, so, so the short answer is I, I don't recommend. There's none that I would recommend specifically only because Microsoft and Google develop their own. Um, and so I've not necessarily tried and tested the external ones, but my understanding is that they all do much the same thing. I think even probably chat GPT, you could probably use something like that would, would, would mm. help in that regard also. Um, but Jennifer, I don't know if you know, uh, have any other sort of thoughts or comments on that? Yeah. I mean, gosh, with, yeah, tools like chat GPT these days and even with the old, all the new Google and Microsoft AI, um, I think if you prompt it in the right way, it can probably help you with the language. Um, one external tool that I have used in the past, but definitely haven't used it very frequently is Textio. Um, I know that's quite good for inclusive language. Um, it's with a like subscription fee, so um, check it out. But yeah, I've used it in the past and it was pretty good. Fantastic, thank you. Um, this one's juicy. Um, can you comment on Elon Musk's clean out of X, formerly known as Twitter? How would you decide that sort of culture or attitude that he's trying to attract? That's a bit of a difficult one to answer. Would either of you like to take it? It's a very, that, yeah, that's a very difficult one to answer. I think he's looking for people like him that want to invest 24 7 in work turn up to the office every day dedicate their their themselves to the mission that he's trying to uh that he's trying to roll out but yeah i i don't know too much about i'm not on twitter nor am i on S. i don't know too much about his decision making around that or the type of person he's trying to attract he's an interesting character though i will say that but um good question something i'm going to be pondering actually that is yeah, I... <laughs> very tricky, tricky question. I, I again, I also, I'm like feel I don't, I'm not on it on X or Twitter or follow Elon that that closely. But look, it's his business, and he is obviously got, you know, his hiring processes and DNA that he has in mind. And if anything, he's probably being really transparent about that up front. So probably is deflecting people from applying if they know they don't want to be on site at a workplace five days a week and work around the clock hours. But some people might be actually really motivated by his, you know, ability to go to space and they want to get on that rocket ship. So I think whilst we probably are like, oh yeah, the way he's doing things is definitely like very specialized, but it's it's his attraction process and he's hopefully getting those type of people apply and working for him and getting great business results and building spaceships. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, next question for us is, what are your views on using a rating scale for assessing interview responses? We had rubrics at both Google and Microsoft, which were guidelines for managers to and interviewers to be able to assess whether a interview was below satisfaction, satisfactory, above what they expected, essentially. Those weren't the exact terms, but something along those lines. And then within each of those categories of below expectations, meets expectations, above expectations, there would be, or strongly exceeds expectations, there would be a very brief description around what that looks like. Did the person just give one example? Did they give two examples? Did they actually answer the question at all? Did they go over and above what you're expecting? Those sorts of things. So you can build out and define certain rubrics that, that do guide managers and interviewers on how to assess the quality of an answer. Um, again, that comes down to investment and manager training, hire, uh, interviewer training as it relates to how to conduct interviews, how to think about what's a strong versus weak answer and those sorts of things. But certainly I would have some kind of barometer for people to work off in order to be able to uh, to be able to assess, Jenny. Yeah, yeah, agree. the The barometer absolutely, I think, definitely helps people make decisions because look, feedback can be quite subjective. But I think when we are looking for that 
you know, objective feedback from an interview panel. It, it's therefore to take the bias out of decision making. And sometimes that might just be a simple like, yeah, is it a thumbs up to proceed or a thumb down to, to decline? It could be like a rating scale, like Phil's highlighted. Um, I mean, there are so many different rating scales that you could incorporate, but I do think incorporating something to really make a firm decision on whether you're going to proceed or, or, or decline a candidate probably just actually helps yeah, the decision-making process and, and try to remove some of those biases when the feedback can be quite subjective we do want to make feedback like super objective um in order to obviously provide that to the candidate as well yeah completely agree um i would add that i know in our applicant tracking system you can set up interview scorecards so that every candidate that's interviewing for that role will be asked the same questions to make sure it's objective and fair um, and then on top of that there is also a star rating that you can give for each answer. So that's kind of all in the system and it's pretty easy. The only thing to know is that, um, as I think Phil and Jen both alluded to, you do need to set some guidelines around um, what a five star or four star or three star answer is. So maybe there's some basic training that you could roll out even asynchronously via um, a recorded video, for example, for some of your hiring managers and then use your applicant tracking system to keep track of it. I hope that helps. Um, next question is, what are some examples of questions that you could ask the candidate to determine cultural fit? I'm happy to have a crack at a couple of those. Um, I mean, there's, there's a ton, right? And again, you can go online and again, you can use chat GPT as well, probably give you a bunch of cultural fit type questions. Um, but Top of mind for me, tell me a time when you had uh, conflict in viewpoints with a colleague or manager and the steps that you have, uh, took to address those differences, right? I think just one thing on interviews, you're better off asking four questions and going deep than 10 questions and having surface shallow answers, right? So if we take that one, for example, tell me about a time when you had a conflicting viewpoint with a colleague or a manager. You can follow up. What were your key learnings from the experience? If you asked your colleague or manager what they observed in you during that process, what would they tell me? If you had a similar situation again, what would you do differently? Those sorts of things. Another question might be, how do you summarize your approach to ethics at work? Have you ever had a, to balance your ethics with a customer situation where you had conflict there? How did you deal with it? What did you do? What would you do differently next time? So on and so forth. There's a ton of different questions that you can ask around that. Um, it's around collaboration, working with others, working ethically. Um, and, and again, there's a lot of tools online that might be able to provide you with a lot of that sort of guidance. Fantastic. And um, our next question is to Phil's comment, I am really keen to understand where you find the line between having a diverse workforce as opposed to a group of clones who are all culturally aligned perhaps for the wrong reasons. For example, perhaps they all went to the same uni or have the same interests outside of work. I've seen this happen too often and it does not work out in the long run. So I think the question there is, how do you really strike that balance between um, making sure they're culturally aligned, but also having some diversity in there? Yeah, I think my first sort of, reaction to that i mean look, we saw that with uber right when travis kalanick was was taken out as a ceo of uber i mean he essentially turned uber into a boys club that was all drinking and partying and it was basically a frat house uh and then he was he was, and it affected the share price it affected the culture it affected the business it affected everything and then since the new guys come in it's completely transformed um i think you have to have the leadership on board with the right again it comes back to leadership you have to have the leadership on board with their uh and for them to lean into being open-minded about trying new profiles, trying new, uh, trying new uh, approaches to hiring, sourcing talent from different talent pools that bring in fresh perspectives and things like that. Um, you've really got to you've got to ask yourself if, if the culture is if the culture is this kind of clones type thing. Is that working for you? Is that going to work for you in terms of what your strategy is over the next six, 12, 24 months? Right. If it's not. You need to get the leadership on board. Recruitment, HR can't do it on their own. You have to get leadership on board because, again, it starts from the top down. And if you have line managers that 
you know, love the love the boys club, love the drinks on a Friday night, even though they've got distributed teams and it's not included, all that sort of stuff, right? You've got to you've got to have a leader that's on board with it and appreciates the fact that it's not just about financial results. It's about how you achieve those financial results. You get the leaders on board, everything else falls into place. You don't get the leaders on board, you're going to constantly be in that kind of uh, point of friction from a cultural perspective. I hope that kind of answers the question in some capacity. Yeah, totally. Um, I would also add um, in the example given, your culture to me should be more about your values, your ways of working, not about things like your hobbies outside of work. So if I've got a particular interest in sailing, um, that's irrelevant unless that's integral to the company somehow because we are a sailing business and therefore we want people that are really passionate about it. Um, it should really be more about values um, and what it is that makes someone successful rather than things like hobbies outside of work or do they drink, do they not drink, whatever the, the kind of barometer might be. Um, next question is, Great session, thank you. Do you have any questions you use or suggestion asking on reference checks? So any questions that we use on reference checks that we think are worthwhile? Yeah, I'm happy to maybe jump in on this one. Um, I think it's really important when you're doing a reference check that again, it, it comes down to the purpose of why you're doing it. Like what feedback are you really trying to solicit from their previous employer um, to determine if they're going to be, yeah, the right hire for your business? Um, a, a question that I really love um, asking is not necessarily zoning in on, you know, the individual's um, weaknesses, but, you know, talk me through their areas of improvement or what were some of their development goals that they had in place when they were reporting into you so that we can continue supporting this person with their career career development you might actually uncover something that is a blind spot to that candidate that they you know might have not been you know uh, transparent about um, it might also just be yeah this candidate actually has been talking so much about working towards this goal great like we know on day one when they start we can actually feed that information back to their line manager and say look this person is actually really serious on becoming a manager so you know when you're in your one-on-ones with them it's really important to have those development conversations so yeah that, that that's a question I like to ask it's really not about like what did this person do wrong it's more about how can we continue helping this person with improving um, themselves um, but also supporting their career development another good question um, is how, how did this person prefer to receive feedback or give me a, you know tell me about a time when you had to deliver tough feedback to them how did they take it what was the approach those sorts of things yeah again largely cultures around collaboration and teamwork and trust and empathy and psychological safety in the team so just sort of drill into those things um, we've got three more questions we will try and whiz through them live um this one is um straightforward What's a great starting point for an EVP? How do you showcase an EVP to your organization? Um, we ran a session on this late last year and it will be on our YouTube page. I can get Sophia um, hopefully to, to send the recording out um, along with post webinar content. So that will be coming your way and it will answer in a lot more detail than we're able to now. Next question is, how important do you believe it is to not hire when you are not sure or have concerns about cultural fit? instead of simply going ahead because you have an urgent need to fill the role? I think it's very important to make sure that you are confident around culture. Um, and look, even if you're confident in culture and then it doesn't turn out to be, then that's one thing. But if you have concerns and still hire them and then that shows up, then that's another thing. It's a lot harder to get somebody out of a role once they're in, um, I think. Um, so, so my, it can cause a lot of pain, even if you think that they've got the skills to deliver is the juice worth the squeeze, right? Because the, the pain that you'll get from having to try to manage them out, if it causes ripples and issues with other members of staff is probably going to be a bigger issue than the fact that they can feel an urgent. Couldn't have said it any better. I'd probably say, yeah, really, really rethink about the importance of the hire. If you're already seeing some red flags, probably best not to. Fantastic. Last question. I've got my own thoughts on this, but I'd love to hear you guys as well. 
Um, what are your views on sending the interview questions to the candidate before the interview? Do you want me to go first, Jenny? Or do you want to go first? Well, I mean, it really is up to you, I suppose. Um, uh, I, I think it's important to actually assess how people can, you know, perform, like, on the spot um, rather than kind of being quite orchestrated. Um, equal to that, we might see um, this uh, play out for a graduate hire where we send kind of questions up front um, but maybe they're expected to um, whether show up to the interview or maybe video record their responses and send them back um, to kind of really get like a genuine answer but yeah I think it's about um, getting that kind of genuine um, or an authentic you know uh, I guess perception of someone rather than it being yeah too orchestrated. Yeah, absolutely. My thoughts on this are that I, I, I don't think you would necessarily send the questions, but send them the attributes that the questions will be assessing, right? So are you assessing them on their technical skills? Let them know. Are you going to assess them on culture alignment? Let them know how they deal with customers, their leadership capability, their agility, those sorts of things, right? So give them the competencies that you're assessing, but not the questions necessarily that, that you're asking to assess those competencies, if that makes sense. I think the only time I've seen when you actually give them something is if it's a presentation phase and you're giving them a case study that you want them to respond to, which is often a very, very good way to assess candidates when they actually give a bit of homework, uh, to do and then present back and how do they present, how do they show up, how do they interpret the questions and so forth. So there's a few things around that, but I think send them the competencies, but not necessarily the questions. Yeah, we are now in the era of chat GPT and it is a flipping fantastic tool, but I can just <laughs> envision a candidate putting that straight yeah. into chat GPT if you send them the exact questions. <laughs> um, so just be yeah, very yeah. cognizant um, of, of how they might be making use of them. Um, we are at time, so thank you ever so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, just a quick note to say that a survey will automatically launch after we end the webinar, and we would really, really appreciate it if you took a minute to fill it in. It really helps to inform the kind of content that we put out in the future um, and really just means a lot to us. Um, so please do fill it in if you have a moment. We will also be sending out some additional resources along with the webinar recording after today's session. Um, and to the individual that asked about EVP, we will make sure to uh, include the recording or a link to that video. Um, I think that's pretty much it. But thank you ever so much to the speakers who joined us today, Jen and Phil. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day and we'll hopefully see you again next time.